Take your Bible, if you will, and look with me to 1 Timothy, the third chapter. 1 Timothy chapter number three. And uh, this probably, I'm not real sure just yet, I am prepared to finish out this book uh, just straight on, but uh, this may be the last sermon we uh, have in this until probably some late April or May, uh, somewhere along in there. I, I'm really sensing God moving in a little bit different direction uh, the Sunday beginning after Easter and maybe for the next four, five, six weeks following that. So really be seeking the Lord, praying about uh, direction that God would have us to go in uh, after Easter. But today we're going to be looking at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, would you stand with me in the honor of the reading of the Word of God as we uh, look at a different theme uh, Paul is taking Timothy on in this wonderful little epistle. And it's the theme of leadership within the body of Christ. Verse number one, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. Now, bishop also could be translated pastor or elder, if you would. Now, you could call me Bishop Mike if you wanted to, but... I would prefer to continue the title of Preacher Mike, if that's or Pastor Mike, whichever one's comfortable for you, but it is an interchangeable term at this point. Verse two, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Uh, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil." Let's go to God in prayer. Father, once again, I ask that you give me the freedom, the liberty, and the anointing to stand here before your people today and to preach your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, you would open our minds and our hearts to receive your word today, to draw us closer to you maybe than we've ever been before uh, with the hopes that we'll be more like Jesus in our life, in our actions, and in our love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. It, today's subject, I, I think, is a very serious, serious matter. Down through these last few years, we have watched spiritual leader after spiritual leader fall by the wayside in his integrity, in his character, and in his morals. In fact, of the matter is, it's hurt the body of Christ. Great men of God who succumbed to all kinds of temptations to fall and surely did. May I say a word to you today? As goes the leader, so goes the church. You show me a church that has leadership that is strong and vital where that man walks in the spirit of God and by faith and not by sight who dares to follow the will of God, even if it goes against the populace, who is leading that fellowship in unity and casting vision that becomes reality. And I will show you a dynamic, spirit-filled, blood-washed church. But you show me a church where there's a lot of squabbling going around that are led and followed with carnal people that don't meet the qualifications that we are going to be looking at in this chapter in a few minutes, who are getting their cue from the populace. And I will show you a church that is in rapid decay and is on its way to a funeral dirge. Very important subject. I've been in both those kinds of churches. Matter of fact, I had the opportunity just this week, this past week, to have been with one of our young preacher boys who launched out 10 years ago to pastor a church east of here. And I was with him all week long. 
And I was absolutely stunned and amazed at the anointing on his life, the strong leadership that he was providing, the vision that he was casting. And before God, I have never been in a church where I sensed that the pastor loved his people more or that the people loved their pastor more than I was this week. And it was no wonder that souls were being saved and that the church was alive and it was filled with unity. Powerful, powerful little church. I, I want to stop a minute because Paul now is giving Timothy some little bit of outlines and guidelines for the men of God, for the bishop, for the elder, for the overseer, if you will, for the pastor. I want you to go with me and let's read these for just a minute. First of all, I want you to see with me this morning that it is a responsible office. You say, how is it responsible? Notice verse one. If a man desire the office of a bishop or the office of an elder or the office of a pastor. Now, when a church gets ready to call a pastor, if a church gets ready to fill the office of an elder, they don't go in between services back in the hallway, come across this guy, grab him by the lapels and say, hey, you know what? I believe you'd be a good pastor. I believe you'd be a good preacher. I believe you'd be a good elder. He said, man, you don't know who I am. Uh, I, I, there's no way that, that I could, oh yeah, I just believe you'd re you're exactly what we're looking for. He looks back and says, well, I, I'm, I'm a hypocrite, man. And they say, well, you know what? The church is filled with hypocrites. Just come on, will you just be another one of us in there? That's not the way that it works. It is a responsible office in that it is one that is called by God. It is men who have that desire. And by the way, let me just say, if you have a desire to be a pastor, if you have a desire to be an elder of a church, you didn't come up with that on your own. God planted that in you. And that, that desire is already manifesting itself. And they have that vision of what that looks like and who it's to be. You're already doing the job. You're already shepherding the people. You already have your heart set on spiritual things things and desire to flesh that out. So there's that desire. Then second, it's a, a responsible office because of the title of the office. If any man desire the office of a bishop or of an overseer or of an elder, this is the word here. The Greek term is episkopos. It is one who watches over. But there's another word in the New Testament called presbyteros that is used interchangeably to describe the, the bishop or the overseer or the elder, and it's throughout the New Testament. So look with me, if you will, at Acts chapter 20 for just a minute. I want you to see in one of those locations where uh, it is used interchangeably. In Acts chapter 20, notice, if you will, verse number 17. The Bible says, and from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders, there's that word here, presbyteros, call for the elders of the church. Now, jump on down to verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and all of the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. There's the word episkopos. So they are used interchangeably in the word. The word episkopos talks about the tasks of the elder or the pastor or the bishop. And the word presbyteros talks about the quality of that man. This is a responsible role because it is the role that God assigns men to oversee the flock of God. Now, the second thing I want you to see with me out of Timothy is that it is a noble office, responsible office, and a noble office. Notice in verse one again, he desires a good work or a noble work, if you will. It's not an honorary position. Although it is a very honorable position, it's not honorary. It is a noble task. It is something that men do with their lives. First, it is who they are, and second, 
It is what they do. Now, thank God for the honor of serving in this capacity. And they perform this role nobly for four reasons. Number one, because they are called to direct the affairs of the local church. Now, notice, if you will, chapter number five. And I want you to see verse 17. Chapter five and verse 17. Let the elders that rule, well, that oversee, that look after the affairs of the church, do it responsibly and do it well. Now, what that means is that the church is not a democracy. Now, get this down, get it straight for me. Our country is a democratic republic. Uh, it is not the same in the church. Uh, it is not a democracy. The church is a theocracy. Uh, it is theocratic in that what that means is that Jesus Christ is the head of the church and he directs the affairs of the church through the eldership of the church. And let me make an announcement to everybody in here this morning, and you already know this, is that uh, First Baptist Church Indian Trail is operated scripturally. Now there's a lot of confusion in many churches because they have implemented what appears to be to them some creative, innovative, pragmatic, practical means uh, and rather than what is revealed in Scripture. Uh, you may not be like me, but this is, this is kind of who I am. Uh, I absolutely cringe every time that I get something shipped to me or I have to buy something and I open it up and I have to put it together. Can I get a witness from anybody in the house? I just cringe. So I get me a screwdriver and a wrench or pliers or something and I go at it. And it's not long until that frustration level gets to the point. And as a last resort, I I read the instructions. Do you know that there's 1,700 churches approximately that close their doors, shut the doors, and shut it down every year in this country? 1,700 a year. Don't you think that we'd be a lot better off if churches would quit trying to figure it out for themselves and simply read the instructions. So, so that, that's there to be a, a theocracy where Jesus is the head of the church and the elders are then charged by the word of God to direct God's plan for the church every day. You know what? There's going to be a lot of surprises when we get to heaven. No question about that. One of the big surprises is, is that there's not going to be any Baptist business meetings when we get there. <laughs> None. Now, the second is it's, it's a shepherding task. Look at chapter 5 uh, of First, Tim, uh, First Peter. Go over a few pages. First Peter chapter 5, if you will, and look at verse 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort, whom also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now, what is, watch what he says. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not uh, away. Now, Christ is the shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. He is the divine shepherd. He's the super shepherd. He is the shepherd. And the elders are simply 
sub-shepherds, underlings that Christ has put over the church to feed the church, to make sure that the church is receiving a proper spiritual diet where the word of God is taught uh, unadulterated, where we know that the word is inspired by the Holy Spirit, infallible, inerrant, heaven-sent word of God. That's the task. Now, I want you to hear my heart a minute because it's a fact. I have submitted myself to some men that are around me. Some watch by television, some watch by internet, some will podcast our services, uh, but they listen to me preach on a regular, some here every week as a matter of fact, and they listen to me preach every week and I have submitted myself to them that I've said to them, guys, let me just say to you, if I get off in a tangent, if I start preaching something that is not biblical, if I get into some heretical kind of teaching, I need for you to come and to confront me and let me know it so that I can clean my desk out and forget this and go do something that I know God's going to be pleased with. Then we have the task of exercising authority. Notice in Hebrews, just a few pages over in that 13th chapter, Hebrews chapter 13, I want you to see verse 7 with me. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. What's it? This is mind-blowing to me. Now, folks, I want to tell you, this next little statement here in the word of God is... Uh, one of the things that absolutely devastate me, watch this, whose faith follow, considering the end of their behavior or their conversation. Do you know how humbling that is? That the word of God is saying to the church, follow the faith of your pastor, emulate what you see in him. I, I want to tell you, when you go on down to verse 17, I hope you, I hope you will. Just look at, uh, again, Hebrews 13 and verse 17. Now, here's staggering. Th this is staggering to me. In verse 17, he says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy, not with grief, for it. That's unprofitable for you. To understand and to know that the Spirit of God has revealed through His Word that there's going to come a day that me, along with every other shepherd, is going to have to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and He's going to say and ask us, and we've got to give an account, what did you do with my sheep? What about the sheep? Powerful. Humbly. Then fourth is the elder's responsibility to the voice of the head of the church and to take the church in that direction. Now here's what some churches do. I know this for a fact. I've watched them do it. I've been in their presence when they did do it. They'll gather their staff together. They'll get off somewhere and they want to get real creative they want to get real innovative and they want to spend a lot of time bouncing ideas and things off of each other and they will concoct this uh, formulation of a plan that they're going to enact in their church and then they will simply go before God and they will say, God bless this mess. That's what happens. It's the reverse of what it ought to be. It ought to be where there is a group of men that will go before the Lord who is the final authority of the church and sit at his feet and listen as he speaks uh, from his word and get his word about the direction, get his agenda, uh, get his plan and his will for the church. Now here's my heart. Sometimes that takes a lot of time. Sometimes it takes prayer and fasting and discussion, and here's the part that absolutely I struggle with, sometimes it means we gotta wait before him 
to study the scriptures to make sure that what we are hearing lines up with the word of God and come then in agreement together as the elders of the church agreeing together and say to the body of Christ, this is where the Lord is leading us, period. Now let me, let me deviate just a tad, not much, but just a tad. Biblical leadership, you won't have to vote on the issues that are already settled in the Bible. You don't vote on that stuff. It is absolutely mind-boggling to me how many churches and how many denominations will gather in their meetings and they will come up with resolutions and motions before those bodies and they will take a vote on something that God has already settled in the word. I could take you to a church not far from here that recently voted on whether or not to believe that the Bible was the inspired word of God. There is a denomination in the last few days that voted as to whether or not they were going to continue to allow homosexuals to pastor their churches. And by the way, they did vote to allow it to happen. We don't have to vote whether abortion is biblical or not. We don't have to vote whether this is the inspired word of God or not. It's already been settled. The virgin birth is not up for debate. The sinless life of the Lord Jesus Christ is not up for consideration. The atoning death is not something whether we're going to determine is valid or not. The resurrection is not something that we have to prove. We believe it and it is settled in the word of God and it doesn't need our vote. So we listen to the leader of the church and we get our direction and we go with him. And then third, I wanna to talk to you for a few minutes about the high qualifications of that office. The qualifications of this office are extremely high. Now there's a lot, now just like last Sunday, I want you to hear my heart because some of you are not going to agree with some of the things that I may say and some of the things, but I, what I've done here is I have taken these qualifications and I've tried my best to give you the best English definition of these qualifications that I believe is available to us uh, today. Now notice what he says here in the scriptures in verse number two. A bishop then must be blameless. Say that word blameless. The best way that I can explain this is simply, it's one against when it is impossible to bring a charge of wrongdoing that could stand up to impartial investigation. Impossible to bring up a charge against a guy that could stand up in impartial investigation. Now, I'm not talking, hear my heart a minute. <laughs> Don't get carried away here. I am not talking, blameless does not mean faultless. If it did, every pastor out there would have to resign. We all have faults, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We wouldn't have any leaders. Then the husband of one wife, it means he is a one woman man. Now we could get into this big discussion about biblical divorce and unbiblical divorce. Uh, I, I have some strong, strong, strong convictions about that matter. I went to church just recently. I worshiped there on a Sunday morning and I discovered after I had worshiped there, he was a great communicator. Everything he said uh, was biblically correct and uh, I, I, I received it. But then I found out that he had been married three times. And I'm thinking, 
How does that match up? How does that stack up? He's to be a one woman man. It means that he, he, he's not roving the market with his eyes trying to figure out if there's something out there that may be available to him. A one woman man, a deep, solid commitment to his marriage. Then there's this word vigilant. It means calm, calm, vigilant, calm. Say the word calm. Now, when I say calm, it doesn't mean that he's got to be stiff like a guy you'd find from the funeral home that was filled with formaldehyde. It's not meaning that at all. It means that he doesn't jump from one thing to another, but it's a humble man. There's a calmness about him. There's a peace about him. There's an inner serenity about him. And then there's the word sober. It means one who is under control, that he's not self-indulgent, that uh, there are certain areas of his life that are not out of control. There's just under control. Then of good behavior. Did you see that term of good behavior? That means he's to be orderly. He's got his prayer life in order. He's got his Bible study in order. He's got his ducks in a row. He doesn't go from one extreme to the other. Then the Bible says he's given to hospitality. Now, in Paul's day, it's a little bit different now than, than in our day. Paul's day, and praise God, I'm glad it is different. In Paul's day, if you were a believer up in Antioch and you were going to go to Jerusalem, as a believer, you're to have that gift of hospitality so that when you travel from Antioch down to Jerusalem, you just showed up at another believer's house and says, I'm here. And be about a week here with you. So you're then because of the scriptures, you have to feed them and just put them up in your house and, and take care of them and extend your grace to them. But we don't do that anymore. If we're going to go to Myrtle Beach, we don't go down there to some believer, a member down there at First Baptist North Myrtle Beach and show up at their lawn and ring the doorbell and say, here I am. But it means that you simply look after the needs of others that you are a people-oriented person. Notice he says apt to teach, able to teach. Now, hear, hear this. This is a little bit stronger than our understanding of that really is. It, it, it goes much deeper than the surface understanding that most of us possess when we start talking about able to teach because there's a lot of charismatic personalities that are out there that have that gift of gab. They're able to communicate. They're really maybe even trained communicators and they find it easy to get before a group of people and talk and to share and just wow the crowd with their verbiage, you know. But that's not what he's talking about here at this point. He's talking about a person that has a grasp and they handle on the word of God so that they handle the word carefully, that they guard and curb heresy when it may arise. So that when the body of Christ may have some biblical questions that arise out of their understanding, then they're able to go. Now, now, now here, we're not talking about some super duper, super califragilistic, expialidocious kind of theologian. Not talking about that, but being able to minister to the people with answers to some biblical questions that may arise out of their walk with God. Apt to teach, not given to wine. Now, folks, I didn't say this. God said this. And for the life of me, I don't understand how today that we accept that a preacher can go sit down with his people with a long neck. I don't get it. I, I don't get it where we can sit down and drink alcoholic beverages. But yet preachers all over this country are propagating the message that it's okay to do. And really even vocalize it and unashamedly talk about it. But the word of God says, eh. I don't get it. Not guilty of filthy lucre. In other words, by the way, I know some guys down through my ministry years that have used the pulpit 
as financial means and as financial gain to line their pockets and to get rich. I've known guys that are like that. They're always looking. How can I take advantage of this? And how can I take advantage of that? So when the Bible says that this pastor, this elder, this bishop should not be guilty of filthy lucre, he's talking about gaining money by some unethical means. And he's also talking about spending money in ways that he ought not to be spending money. Handling money correctly. I, I've told preachers, I've told young preachers all my ministry, the three ways, three things you better guard against, pride, women, and money, because it will get you if you're not careful. Now, then he says, where am I at? I forgot. Money. Patient. Well, I need a little bit of that. Not a brawler. Not quarreler. Have y'all ever met anybody that just likes to fuss? You say, that's white. No, it's not. It's black. They're just going to fuss. Please don't look at one another. when I, I don't want to know who you I. They just want to pick an argument about something. I know some pastors like that. It, they're just getting a conversation. And they're always looking and searching and, and looking through the atmosphere for something that they can, that they can disagree with all the time. All right, let me go on not covetous. I know some pastors that are denominational climbers. They're looking, I want to be president of the North Carolina Baptist State Convention. I want to be president of the pastor's conference. I want to be president of the convention. Nah. Don't be covetous of somebody else's position. Then notice this other one, rules his own house well. Rules his children well. That, that word in, the, in there, talking about children, now, please, please don't be quick to jump on a pastor, an elder, staff member, who may have a 30-year-old son or daughter that's living like hell here and, and just really in sin, deep in sin, and you want to jump on them as a parent. They're not responsible for what their kids are doing at 30 or 35 years old. This is the word paideia, and it means little children that are still around, that are shapeable and are moldable and under the tutelage of their parents. And the Bible simply says here uh, to the pastors, if they can't take care of those kids, how in the world can they manage the affairs of the family of God? So just wanted to maybe clear that up just a little bit. Okay, let's go on. Not a novice. Not a novice. They, in other words, they must be a seasoned believer. Now, I love new Christians. I love the excitement. I love the enthusiasm. I love the zest, and I, and I love their zeal. But oftentimes, new believers, they, they will operate so much in their excitement that if they're not careful, they'll start making decisions out of the flesh rather than the spirit. And he's saying, don't you take a brand new Christian and make a preacher out of them or an elder out of them because if they're not careful, they'll start making these fleshly carnal decisions and they'll get puffed up and it'll blow their mind. So just stay away from them, get a seasoned believer. Now he, he ends this just the same way that he started. He said, make sure they have a good report from without. In other words, he's saying, um, if you really want to know what a guy's like, go ask his mother-in-law. Hmm? Go ask his neighbor. Go ask the people that uh, they work for. Down through the years, I I've had... I've had some, some questions come up and they'll say, uh, is so-and-so in your church? And I would say, yeah, as a matter of fact, they're serving on staff or they're serving uh, as a deacon. And they would say, really? I'd say, yeah, yeah. Well, pastor, you really don't know what they're really like, do you? So they got to have a good reputation without a good report from uh, those that are not necessarily in the body of Christ. So here he is, he's saying to the bishops, to the elders, um, you're in a position of leadership and you're going to be judged with a greater strictness. 
I, I, I frankly, <laughs> my wife and I, we, we, we chuckle from time to time. People always ask me, this is one of the most asked questions of me and Kathy is, uh, where do y'all go that you can just get away a little bit? Where do you, what restaurant do you go to? You, I bet y'all have to go out of town to even eat dinner together, don't you? And, and we just kind of laugh about it because the fact of the matter is we don't go anywhere because nowadays uh, with the TV, you know, there's about 2 million, I think, or maybe even more than that, that may have access to our, our, our services now through uh, the television. And so we, we can't go anywhere in this whole area without being scrutinized. I, I was at a restaurant just recently and I was sitting there and a couple of guys were with me and we were eating and I, and, and I heard it in the background, First Baptist Church in Indian Trail. And I, oh, they're talking about me. And, and, and you know what? People have a look when you walk into a place now and, and I've, I've learned to spot it. I can tell it. They know who I am. They just got that look about it. And, and the other day, <laughs> We, we were out, and uh, so I just left my booth, and, and I, I got one of those looks from somebody, and uh, we, we were on, uh, over near Harrisburg, and I got one of those looks, and so I just left my table, and I just went over and shook hands and just stood there at their table while they were eating for a while. <laughs> and, and Kathy said, you ought not to do that. You know how that feels. I said, well, I can dish you down about as good as I can take it. I've just come to believe it comes with a turf. But you know, here's, here's the point. You know, why are you telling all that stuff? I'm going to tell you why. You ready? I'm going to close with this. It makes a difference to me, and I believe it makes a difference to the Lord. I believe it makes a difference to you. That I'm as transparent on Wednesday as I am on Sunday morning. I want to be that way. I want to be that kind of man. There are three areas here that you see that revolve right out of it. It talks about the man's personal life, talks about his domestic life, and it talks about his church life. 